Good afternoon and welcome to our latest DMU research event. I'm Professor Shushma Patel, Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean for the Com Faculty of Computing, Engineering and Media. And it's my pleasure to chair this webinar, um, which has a focus on the impact of COVID-19 in the context of International Women's Day. Today, we have three leading DMU scholars who will deliver speed lectures followed by a panel discussion and then a Q&A session. Our opening talk is the impact of COVID-19 on women researchers, an observation by Professor Joe Richardson, Associate Dean for Research and Innovation in the Faculty of Business and Law. This talk will reflect on some of the challenges that women researchers have faced during the pandemic. It will reflect on the dimension of the impact of blurred boundaries and inequalities of working from home during lockdown, and it will suggest some ways in which women researchers can be supported. This will be followed by Escaping COVID, the pleasures and politics of contemporary period drama by Dr. Vicky Ball, BC 2020 senior lecturer. Television has performed a critical public service during um, role, public service role during the pandemic, and interestingly, it is period dramas from the Queen's Gambit to Bridgerton, which have proved particularly popular during periods of lockdown. The lecture unpacks the popularity of the feminine historical drama and examines the form's cultural significance as mediator of women's society, history. And finally, Women Reflected Through Me by Lala Meredith Bula, Professor of Art and Photography. In Professor Lala Meredith Bula's archives are countless images of women fulfilling their roles at the very edge of history. These archives, which cover four decades and record a period of intense turmoil in the Balkans and elsewhere in Europe. Looking at them afresh from today's perspective, Professor Meredith Bula sees women suffering as they strive to hold their families together, and her work shows how their struggle and their achievements reflect society's own efforts to stay in the frame. So why is research important and what is the significance of International Women's Day? If we consider research first, research gives us the opportunity to discover new knowledge, um, we call that pure research, and expand what we already know, applied research, and why is um, International Women's Day so significant? Well, International Women's Day is a recognition of women globally. It's one day of the year that recognizes the value of women, um, the value women bring to individual communities and collectively to the world. It also showcases the incredible struggles of women who have paved the way for others. It has been observed since 1908 in the USA and around 1913, 1914, it was agreed to mark it annually on 8th of March globally on the Gregorian calendar. In terms of research, at DMU, we have more submissions from women for REF 2021 compared to previous submissions. So today we're celebrating the research of three DMU scholars. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Professor Joe Richardson. Shushma, thank you very much indeed for that introduction. Um, and I, I can't wait to hear from uh, from Vicky and Lala as well. I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. So thank you. I'm going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on women researchers, but I've purposefully called my, my brief talk an observation. Um, because while some of the information I'm going to go through around women and home is very much part of research I've done for the last 20 years, uh, the, the stuff I'm going to talk about on uh, the impact of COVID-19 on women researchers is exactly that. It's an observation from having talked to fellow women researchers at DMU over the previous months. It's not part of a rigorous research project yet. So I just wanted to make it clear where that's coming from. So thank you very much. I'm going to start off, um, if I can get my slides to move through. I'm just having some trouble doing actually. Um, apologies for the technical 
glitch. I might have to plow on without my slides because they're not moving on my screen, unfortunately. So um, unless anyone behind the scenes can help put the slides up instead and I'll stop sharing, um, then we might be able to do that. Uh, yes, please, Sandra, do try if you can. Thank you. So I'm going to start off COVID-19 challenges. Um, and before I go on to challenges, I wanted to talk through the opportunities. So there have been some opportunities. Um, there have been more flexible approaches. We've done things, I think, across the UK um, in business, in universities and schools. We have moved uh, in a very agile, very flexible way and perhaps surprised ourselves to how quickly we can um, enact change, how quickly we can do things. And whilst there have been very many challenges working from home, there have been, as I say, opportunities through this flexible working approach. There have also been new fields of study. So we've been able to explore the impact of COVID-19. You know, our health researchers have been looking at this. We've been looking at this in business and law. Um, a number of my colleagues in my faculty are, are looking at the impact of COVID-19 and the challenges. So those are just two opportunity areas that have come up. Um, but clearly there have been challenges too. Uh, one of these is around uncertainty and anxiety. And I don't think that we can um, really stress this enough, uh, the impact that this has had. And I'm going to come on in a, a short while to talk about some research that has been done on this. And I referred to this um, when I was chairing the session earlier on this morning, um, because um, Alice, uh, who is chief executive of, of WEN, her organisation, WEN, uh, have produced a, a piece of work called Sharing the Caring. And we're going to look at a few statistics from that. But we know that women take up um, a large proportion of the unpaid domestic labour. It's always been true. It continues to be true. And there's some data on that. Um, and so th there is an anxiety around, am I doing it right? Um, what about balancing homeschooling? What about trying to continue to carve a career in, in um, higher education? And uncertainty as to the health of loved ones, uh, how family members are doing, how our colleagues are doing. So I think that's had a, a huge impact. And I think women have taken up a considerable burden of that emotional work. Um, there are also clearly the pressures of balancing research, teaching administration um, in our, our jobs and the, uh, the impact of teaching remotely. Um, and the additional work that that has entailed, how that balances then with the opportunities that may arise to do further research. And the balance again with this, with the caring duties at home um, and indeed the disrupted support networks. So there hasn't been, uh, we've not been able to outsource um, childcare, other domestic labour um, that, that might have been outsourced previously. So the whole kind of support system has come to a standstill during COVID-19 and the lockdown. We're also missing the social glue. So I noticed this, um, I'm co-chair of DMU Women Network with my fabulous colleague Yasmin. And we've noticed that when we've been running online sessions, um, I noticed this when I run my online menopause cafes, um, we, we see that people are craving this social connection, social glue to try and make sense of the world and to move things along and it just makes work more enjoyable and other challenges that have arisen field work clearly has been seriously interrupted changed challenged um, sometimes that's irrevocable we can't get back the time that we would have gone on various global visits there are, are upsides to this in terms of environmental sustainability but in the short term there have been hits on the opportunity to undertake field work then, of course, there are the intersectional multi-layered impacts of COVID-19 on not just the researcher, but the research participants. So there's a, an emotional burden in terms of that as well. Um, so we're, we're, we're worried about the people that we would ordinarily be working with on our research projects. And then we can think, are we really working from home or are we indeed living at work? Um, there's this blurring of boundaries, lack of downtime. Um, and I think that that is taking its emotional toll on all of us, um, including women. So next slide, please, Sandra. Um, so we can think about this blurred boundaries, this, you know, are we working from home or living at work? And um, this really links in with 
the research I've been doing, um, well, for the last 20 years. And then prior to that, I've been a practitioner. I've been a housing officer and I've worked in policy and practice in housing. So this is my area. This is my discipline. And we very much know that home is a socio-spatial system. So within wider society, it's an, another unit in which we can examine how people interact. Um, and so home isn't isolated from the challenges in society, it replicates them. So home reflects and reproduces the inequalities that we might see in broader society. Um, a, a, a writer called Charlotte Gilman, um, over 100 years ago now, at the turn of the last century, um, she wrote about home as a place of love and duty, so this duality, um, and this it's a challenge for women uh, to to conceptualise where their where their space is in the world and then at home, and we can see this really amplified during lockdown. So working two shifts, but at the same time, so there's not even the respite at the office from the home duties. The home duties are happening all of the time and indeed homeschooling. And we've seen this, everyone's seen this in terms of Zoom meetings that have had miniature research assistants joining in. Um, so we know that this is happening and, and we can see that this shift between the two different performances, if you like, of, of women at work and at home are happening in the same space now. But also we know that home isn't necessarily a place of safety. So there's lots of, of work, lots of research. Um, here at DMU, we've got colleagues like Mel Crofts and Vanessa Bettinson and many others who are working on the issue of domestic and family violence. So there is uh, that to contend with, where home is not a place of safety at all. Um, but more broadly, home might be contested. It might be precarious. It might be those living in rented accommodation um, that they are facing the end of a tenancy and there's that um, increased uncertainty and the lack of security. So we think about, we can think about home as a place where you perform from. Um, so I talk about this in my book, Place and Identity, the performance of home. So it can be a stage for those um, living in home, which is secure and safe. It's a stage from which you can then perform your other lives your work life, your social life, all of these things happen from a home which is taken for granted if it feels safe and secure. Um, if it's not safe and secure, it's absolutely not taken for granted and it becomes such a big part of your everyday thinking. That can then clearly have challenges on the ability to uh, be educated, employed, all of the other things that we want to do for a, a happy, healthy life. So. These are issues that are connected with us in our, our working lives, but they're currently, and during lockdown particularly, being performed at home. And this is an interesting space to explore more, and it's something that I'm going to look at in future research. So I want to talk a little bit about this um, domestic labour. Um, and as I mentioned, um, Charlotte Gilman talked about this a lot um, just over a century ago, and we've continued to talk about it. You know, we know Caroline Criado Perez talks about um, invisible women and how society is designed for the default human, which is male, white male. Um, we need to really challenge this. So this choose to challenge hashtag I, I'm loving today because we, we must continue to challenge the gender dimension of work and home. So we'll go on to the next slide, please. So. This uh, little excerpt um, that you'll see um, on one side of the slide is um, an infographic taken from the Sharing the Caring report by um, Women's Higher Education Network. It's well worth looking at. If you just Google Sharing the Caring when, you'll get to it. Um, but it, it tells us what we already know, but it tells us in a very helpful and obvious way. But um, what it does do is it looks further at what happened during lockdown, because we know that the dynamics changed a little during lockdown. We know that unpaid care and domestic work in the home is largely undertaken by women, more so than men. Um, and this was, in fact, amplified during lockdown to a degree. So you can see, hopefully, in that slide, um, there are various Things. So coordinating and organising children's activities, 
Um, so this continued to be predominantly women's work during lockdown. Helping with schoolwork, again, um, you know, whilst we've got 27% of men reporting that they help with schoolwork, it was still mostly women. And if you're also balancing, uh, trying to keep your career going and keep the home happy and help with schoolwork, um, that's a lot. Making meals, largely women, but um, men over over a quarter of, of um, uh, men say that they um, have some responsibility for making meals. Um, Providing emotional support, I think um, this was this was probably more challenging during lockdown, and I don't have the full report in front of me, but I, I urge you to, to read it um, because we can see that women there, 45% um, providing emotional support and um, a relatively small percentage of men. And I think this probably moved during lockdowns. So as we're coming out of the third lockdown, it will be interesting to see what's happened with that. And possibly no surprise here, but play, the fun stuff, um, the men really stepping up to the plate to, to, to play with the kids. Um, so this is, we, we know this, it's amplified to a degree during lockdown, but also there are some opportunities to change because there are ways that we can make our organisations more flexible, accommodate the beneficial elements of the working from home that we saw during lockdown. I'm just going to come up to my last slide now. And I want us to think about how we can support women in research. So what are the next steps that we should take? And I'm very interested in this, obviously, as being co-chair with Yasmin of DMU Women. And what we've tried to do is, is keep connected. So our strap line for DMU Women is amplifying voices through connection. Um, and this obviously was disrupted because we were no longer able to meet face to face. But we've continued with online workshops, meetings, seminars, as say the menopause cafe, a number of other things we've we've been trying to do. So that's the first point is, is continuing that online connection, continuing those events. And we can carry on doing that. We've recognized that there's a flexibility in doing things online. Um, hopefully we'll be able to bring in some face-to-face -face elements um, as we move out of the pandemic. Um, but we'll probably always keep an element of online because it means that people who have got childcare responsibilities, people with disabilities who may not be able to come into the campus uh, very readily can still join in, can still connect their, their voices to ampl amplify what we want to achieve. Um, we also want to be working with WEN, so the Women's Higher Education Network, um, and this is for all women. So I think sometimes in a university environment, we think, too much about academics and we don't always bring in the professional services so whilst this session is about women in research at DMU there's a, a lot of that professional services support that comes in that enables the context for us to be able to undertake our research and so I think if we can make the connections through wider um, support networks like WEN that will be very helpful again for the future We've got networks, for example, my colleague Kate in business and law runs the Women in Research Network, and this has been helpful. There have been a couple of meetings online um, for colleagues to get together and, and provide that peer support. But what we need to do is move away from expecting individual women to make their lives better. We need to structure this into the work environment. So the idea of structuring and flexibility is a challenging one. Um, but it's something that we need to uh, look at and we need to support the Monfort University and universities across the sector to consider. So we must reflect, gather data and analyse our future world of work um, in order to uh, consolidate the benefits that we've seen from the flexible working from home um, and, and continue to work out ways that we can provide support so that women aren't doing that um, unpaid domestic labour and impinging on their careers but so that we can support them um, in a more flexible way. And finally, I think specific support for women researchers who are anxious about the impact that the pandemic has had on future career progression and opportunities. So it may be if they've had stalled field work or a publication hasn't gone in quite when they wanted to, that can cause some anxiety. So I think there's plenty of work for people like me as Associate Dean Research in the Faculty of Business and Law and other colleagues, other senior women researchers 
um, there's plenty of space for us to think about how we can support colleagues earlier on in their career to ensure that they don't feel that this um, lockdown, this pandemic has had undue negative impact on their future careers. So that's a whistle stop tour. It's, as I said right at the start, it's an observation. Um, but I think it's been interesting to think about working from home or living at work and making sure that we get the balance right and that we support women researchers for the future. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Vicky Ball. Over to you, Vicky. Thanks, Jo. And uh, that was uh, really fantastic. And I'm sure it all chimes with us about those themes of the, about the dual role of, of, of home, especially during the pandemic. And um, I guess my paper chimes a little bit with that in terms of staying on the theme of home, and particularly where I presume we're all watching television at home because we're not as mobile as we usually uh, are in terms of being able to watch television now on the move. Um, and so I research women and uh, British television drama. And my research has been a little bit sort of uh, challenging because it relies on archival research. So I'm looking at um, plays during the 70s and 80s at the moment, which, as I say, relies on conducting oral history interviews with people who are still alive, who wrote and created those dramas or uh, using the archive. Um, researching the dramas and from the papers that still exist. So while that research has been quite challenging, I found myself over the Christmas period watching more and more television, more contemporary television than perhaps I would normally would. Um, and perhaps like the other 82 million people out there, um, I found myself addicted to Bridgerton um, and binge watching it over a couple of nights. Um, and if you're not familiar with Bridgerton, it's a historical drama, um, a romantic historical fiction um, from the novels of Julia Quinn, but um, created and uh, by uh, Shonda Rhimes and Chris Van Dusen, who are American showrunners um, associated with things like Grey's Anatomy and Scandal in the US. And what intrigued me was not just the pleasures of the text itself, but the ways in which that that drama had been received publicly. So it was, you know, a lot of people had seemed to enjoy it, but it was seen to be a little bit like uh, it described a little bit like a guilty pleasure, you know, like oh, we're all we're kind of all enthralled, but why? Why are we so enthralled by this this period lavish drama? Um, and for this, I wanted to think about. Um, uh, oops, I can't see my slide. Sorry. There you go, thank you. Um, of, of thinking about um, you know, the, 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 the pleasures of the text, but, but why it was discussed in this way and what was the significant, the gendered aspects of the way in which it had been received. Um, and so I wanted to think about that in the context of my research of women's other historical dramas. Um, just going to put that over there, that's okay. And so looking at the text itself, um, obviously, Bridgerton um, forms part of other of, of the contemporary television scape, really, where historical or period dramas have become quite popular. So, Bridgerton is is obviously um, become popular over the Christmas period, as did the the, the Queen's Gambit, but also Netflix had also um, you know been uh, been highly uh, praised for its uh, drama The Crown but if we think about British telly then we can also uh, think about Call the, Call the Midwife which has been running for almost 10 years now and it's on its 10th series um, even despite um, co uh, Covid disrupting its um, its schedule on television recently. Um, but clearly, while these are contemporary examples of historical fiction, they're not the first. And the popularity of, of historical fictions go right the way back um, to the beginnings of television, but particularly from the late 60s onwards, when we had the Forsyth saga, um, which was uh, introduced to really um, um, jazz up BBC Two, which had been running for a couple of years, and it did it did the trick. And so, if if you think about um, Bridgerton attracting 82 million viewers um, across its across its period of time when it's been on television, the Forsyth saga from 1967 
has seen audiences of, of 165 million. So you can think about the, you know, the popularity of, of period dramas, but also certainly other kind of feminine um, costume uh, dramas, such as Upstairs, Downstairs from the 70s, that saw a recent reincarnation, um, and things like A Family at War, if, if you also uh, remember that particular text. But certainly um, one of the sort of points I want to make today was the way in which these texts, although popular and, you know, remembered by people like myself as historians and also perhaps fans of the drama at the time, they've been sort of critically neglected because they're seen as this sort of feminine form of, um, of historical fiction, particularly in comparison to um, um, the more kind of political variant of historical fiction, um, dramas such as The Cheviot, The Stag and the Black, Black Oil, or um, Days of Hope, um, directed by, you know, big uh, prolific director Ken Loach. Um, and so one of the dangers of that, because these two types of drama are put, up, are, um, put next to one another and compared, it's always that kind of overtly political drama, such as Days of Hope or The Cheviot, The Stag and the Black, Black Oil, that's seen as progressive politically, they're seen to inform and educate, that's telling us something about history, wherein, you know, it, it sidelines this more sort of what's seen as the more um, entertainment load, the more popular feminine fiction, um, it's such as, you know, Upstairs, Downstairs, or indeed, as we'll come to think about, uh, Bridgerton. Uh, in particular, there's, it, there's a sort of insidiousness about the ways in which um, these kind of progressive and popular dramas have been polarised in, in accounts of television, particularly for the way in which, as I've said, the, that political text is seen as progressive. Yeah, it's usually um, informed by left-wing values, whereas the popular her heritage text is seen as quite conservative. And indeed, um, a colleague at Warwick, Helen Wheatley, has argued, you know, we have to be careful about making such binary oppositions uh, or, or seeing these texts as in such binary oppositions, because largely, um, all texts can be seen to be both progressive um, and entertaining. Um, in particular, texts that I would argue from the UK's past in a range of um, dramas that were, were kind of made to shine a light on her stories as opposed to histories and bring to the fore the different on many incarnations of women in public life from the suffragettes and shoulder to shoulder from 1974 all the way through to women's experience of the First and Second World Wars in, in things like Testament of Youth, Tenko and Wish Me a Look from the 80s. So as I say, those particular texts um, are usually ignored or overlooked. They may be remembered fondly by people, but they've been overlooked critically because they're kind of bandied together as these popular feminine forms of drama. But if you do take a close look at them, they tell us much not only about women's history then, but also pull through about some of the politics around the status and position of women in culture, feminine values, the dialogues with, um, with feminism as well, which are important. But um, so it's a kind of whistle stop tour here through some of the significance of women's historical dramas. But what about, um, you know, the, at, the, at the end of the spectrum where Bridgerton sits, the kind of text of romantic historical fiction that's aligned with entertainment and escapism. Um, and for this, I would, I would argue that such texts um, embody a sense of um, or engage with um, the pleasures of, of escapism, which Christine Geraghty, um, in a lovely book, which was written 30 years ago this year, called Women in Soap Opera, um, she talks about the, the utopian possibilities that are embodied by um, feminine forms of, of fiction, from soap opera to um, um, romance narratives such as those embodied by Mills and Boone's novels. And she talks about how um, texts such as these, which I would talk about Bridget in this context, um, all embody certain qualities and values that are lacking in everyday life, which are therefore um, um, inform such texts and where, where we gain pleasure. So in other words, um, in something like Bridgerton, we have a sense of how in that kind of blurring between or marrying of history and fantasy, as Chris Van Dusen, the, the, one of the creators, terms it, we have a sense about what the world could be like, uh, how it may be organised, um, particularly at the level of, of, of gendered cultural values, where there's such a concentration on traditional feminine values, such as emotions and, um, and, and home and family but particularly here in, in Bridgerton and the level of race as well, and ways in which it tries to imagine a world which is uh, or a regency that was more racially integrated and people of colour occupied um, positions within society. 
So in that sort of um, aspirational utopian world, it offers a sense about how things could be better, how things may be imagined and maybe may come to be realised. Um, and in particular, thinking about um, those five utopian possibilities, so those kinds of values that are, are lacking in everyday society, we can think about the pleasures of Bridgerton in terms of, you know, energy and abundance. And to this, I liken it to um, Christian Garrity's analysis of those kind of big blockbuster American soaps from the 80s, Dillis and da uh, Dynasty in Dallas, where you have, um, you know, the, the narrative moved on by swift dialogue, by quite sharp dialogue, by bitchiness in some respects, but you also have the kind of over-the-topness in terms of costumes and narrative, the, 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 the narrative being moved on by gossip too. So there's a certain camp and kitschness to um, um, overtly within Bridgerton, I think, which chimes with that sense of abundance that you, you have within that imagined world. And to the extent where you kind of have a parody of, of the historical fiction, you know, so there's a kind of real sense in which gender and, and race and class has been performed here. And we can think about in perhaps in questions, you know, what, you, what what the significance of that aspect of the text is. Uh, but crucially, at the heart of this text, um, in th there are the two qualities, I think, which really um, have captured the imagination, certainly from the, the reviews that I've read of Bridgerton, is you know, that, that romance narrative at the centre of, of the text between Daphne and Duke Simon uh, Bassett. And particularly, um, again, mirroring the sort of traditional Mills and Boone romance fiction, is you have a kind of intensity and transparency of emotion um, and where the narratives moved on by the declarations of love which are captured in the way in which um, uh, uh, Reggae Jean Page who plays uh, Simon Bassett was you know asked to kind of re reperform those those magic words in Bridgerton at the Golden Globes where he says you know uh, spoiler alert here those declarations of love which connect with transparency and intensity with I burn for you and Daphne uh, recalls back to him those same words. So in essence then, um, Bridgerton offers us um, uh, a chance to escape into a world that seemingly offers solutions to um, problems and values that are, are not present in contemporary society, particularly perhaps most um, acutely in the realm of, in the, in the time of COVID, and particularly in this sense of offering an, an idea where um, traditional values of feminity are offered. We could argue, you know, think about this in terms of questions. Does that mean that women are just offered, um, you know, the, the, the places and spaces that that have been offered to women traditionally in terms of the home and emotions and uh, and, and so on, or does the text, um, particularly with its uh, racial reconfiguration, there suggest um, a, an alternative of being, or is this uh, simply a very kind of traditional fashion drama at the heart of it? So I shall leave it there and I shall now pass you over to Professor Lala Meredith um, Vula uh, and her paper. Hi, thank you very much Vicky and thanks Jo um, for a great talk and, it, and this is something completely different but somehow it's related to both those themes in a, a very um, distant way. Um, I'm going to start with the slide. So here we go. That's it. Brilliant. Um, um, my work has been created over COVID. Uh, it's been looking back at my archives throughout 35 years of working in photography and drawing and art. Uh, and it's I've suddenly realized that I've been taking pictures of women uh, throughout this time, I, but I haven't really been focused on doing a project about them. They just appear um, throughout my archive, even to the modern day. If I see something interesting, I'll try and capture it. But here I'm making, um, I'm, I'm actually making art. It's something slight, it is still in the university we term as research, uh, but I call it art and us artists call it art that we show. Uh, and something very important is that uh, we're doing it so that the viewer can see and have and um, be moved by it. So I would invite you all to make comments during this talk uh, if there's anything that uh, strikes your feelings or what, what the photographs do for your feelings. Uh, you can type that in and share that if you want to. Um, there may be also pauses because uh, talking is is not really what this is about. It's about asking your eyes to 
to inform you and allow you to lead you uh, emotionally. So um, it's rather than me just talking at you and telling you what you should feel, you can actually think uh, what you see and, um, and let that affect you. Um, so I was always on other missions, photographing haystacks. And here I've asked a, a lady who's in the farm to um, scare the sheep into the picture. And so that's how she's sort of bombed in this picture. Um, but it was an interesting how women have creeped into my pictures. Uh, here I was just on the way somewhere and saw this beautiful scene um, of women there making threads from silk. Uh, and weaving something and they've gone um, into the street uh, to do this because a house is often um, not enough room so and it's in Kosovo. Uh, this is in Albania in 1992 uh, and here I just saw a woman walking actually and she was knitting at the same time so it's multitasking. Um, so it was sort of called her over to take this picture uh, and as she walks through her day, she can knit at the same time and travel. This one, um, I, I didn't. I came into a yard. I was going to photograph the landscape, uh, and I just found this um, woman who was. I didn't actually see her at first. I saw the child, uh, and that's what I really like. That you, you just eventually see the woman um, behind the loom. So they're, they're all taken over quite a vast amount of time. This is in Albania as well. This um, woman I, I saw from far away um, walking over the landscape and it wasn't till uh, she got up close that I could see that actually she was carrying a child and that uh, there she is, you can see, and that the child was sitting on a suitcase. So look at the landscape, you can see where she's coming from and how she's got to climb up the mountain. The guy's holding the child's hand and here you've got a close up, so she's made some kind of a um, carry there, but she's also carrying a suitcase as well. Um, often, um, you know, cooking is quite a, a labour intensive uh, task and the kitchen would be a focus for the community. So people would come in and have a fag and chat while a woman would be working away. Um, you'd often have old people around um, um, and just um, this would be like a focus uh, for a social place, which ties in with what Joe was saying about the home. Uh, and always a woman will be multitasking. And here's even better. You can see the state of some of the kitchens. So it's almost like an outhouse. You've got an alga. You're cooking, making bread. And the, the kids and people will stop by and socialize. This is a recipe where you're using the the lid of the of, of a kind of heater on the fireplace there, and then you heat this from above. It's a bit like grilling. It's called flea in Albanian, and this is in Kosovo in 1999. But but for me, the year that I take them is irrelevant. I want to make them like paintings, sort of timeless. Uh, so there's no idea that they've been done 10 or 15 years ago or a month ago. Um, this is a sort of symbolic moment that I want people to look at artistically and I want them to be moved emotionally. Here the women are making a woolen thread so they actually get the um, wool and then uh, by twisting, you can make a wool, woolen thread. Uh, and you can see actually, like the woman previously was knitting and walking, it's quite handy that you, you can just walk about, chat, um, and go and visit people and keep making balls. You can see um, on the ground, the ball of thread. 
And this is a closer view of the same woman. And often women farming. These women are from a very particular area of Kosovo, the Has district. Um, in their everyday dress, they have these built up, um, I've got a close up here. The hips are built up with wood, wooden kind of yoke that's around their waist. And that's handy for carrying. So you can put a child on that kind of shelf on the hips, or you can put a milk churn. Here's a, a, a blood feud event where you can see the women of different generations are particularly like this one. So one's in the traditional dress and then modern dress uh, of all different types. This one, the grandmother um, is looking after the child, and that's in fact a um, cot, it's a cradle. Uh, and that cradle is very handy. You can kind of swaddle the baby and um, also rock the baby with your foot and cook at the same time. So these things are designed so that you can multitask. And there's, you can see them more in use. Uh, the cradles are more in use and you can see the, the swaddled children there. And often older children are uh, like carers. So they will start rocking the child. And here you see those women from that particular Hass region and she's holding up the cradle. You can see the swaddled child better. And this is a gypsy woman, just to sort of finish off um, with her home um, tied in there. But um, just thinking about what um, Vicky said about these roles and um, about this era and these people that have the roles that they have been set to do. Um, these women are often born in these roles. They don't have a choice. Um, but. I'd like to throw out a question whether they they often are self-sacrificial and they want to dedicate their lives to caring um, and whether they're, they, they might not be aware of the important job that they're doing, uh, they just keep caring. So that's kind of rounded up my talk there. Is that 10 minutes? <laughs> So now we we'll go over to the panel. Thank you very much, Lala. So we've had um, some really fantastic talks. Um, we've taken the fantastic visual that Lala has just given us um, and walked through the four decades in the Balkans. And I'd like to invite our other speakers, Joe and Vicky, to join us um, for the panel discussion. And uh, while they join us, um, We've had um, these talks, the three fantastic talks from our scholars, starting off with the reality of working from home during COVID-19, then looking at escapism. I'll call it escapism if you don't mind, Vicky, rather than progressive. Escapism in feminine historical dramas, and then finishing with how daily life has changed in the Balkans over a period of time. So at the start of the academic, people started talking about COVID-19 being the great equaliser. However, it's become very clear, and especially from the talks that we've had today, and um, Joe, your talk in particular, that simply isn't true. So what lessons can we take forward um, for future planning? And Joe, you've talked about supporting women in research, but more broadly for all women, what are the lessons that we can learn from this particular period um, for COVID-19. Start off with Joe, if you don't mind, but then open it up to all the other panel members. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I think there is so much yet to research and learn from this period. I mean, today is the first tape back for children at school for, for very many mums. So 
Um, today will be a day of trying to figure out how to start um, acting again in a way that is not involving um, homeschooling children and, and managing the, the whole thing all the way through the day. So I think there's much yet to do in terms of gathering data on that, gathering opinions and, and views. Um, but I'm just I'm very keen that we work with businesses and with organisations so that um, it's not left to the individual woman. Um, our DME women, we uh, our strapline is amplifying voices through connection, and that's exactly what we need to do. That's what events like um, this lecture today is all about. Um, and we do need to learn from other businesses who perhaps have been able to embed some of their flexible approaches. We need to learn from other organisations that have policies that are really designed with women in mind so that um, a bit like Caroline Criado Perez in her work, Invisible Women, recognises that the default human is male and probably white. We need to try and redress the balance of that. So purposefully, we need to deconstruct our policies, our processes, our way of working and think, where is the woman in this? How are we supporting women in, in this approach? Uh, so I don't have a, a, a definite list of, of things to do, but there, there is much work to do, I think. And we can be here to support one another, but we need to think about framing this institutionally so that we can make some structural changes. Thank you, Jo. Um, Vicky, so looking at it through, you know, period dramas, or, or even actually just as a researcher, if that's okay, um, yeah, Shushma, I was thinking about, you know, what, what, what's what been so unique about this year and, and as, a, as a, a person with two young children below the age of five, actually in some ways we've, we've had all those issues that Joe's outlined there, particularly and one of the big ones I think for female research is to not feel like you're falling behind. Mm -hmm. um, particularly with research during this period. I think that's been a sort of chronic anxiety. But actually research has been the thing that's kept me going, even to be able to think about it when, you know, when things have got really tough. Um, and because I think, again, it's a bit of escapism in a different sense to a world that you love and it kind of keeps, keeps giving you momentum, doesn't it? And in that respect, I really hope that some of the technologies that we've used this year in terms of, you know, being able to connect in conferences and events and shorter seminars, mm -hmm. I hope that carries on actually for future years because it means you can beam into a conference in, in a way that as a working mother, I probably wouldn't have had a chance to do um, last year. I think the other third thing really it's taught me is to kind of slow down a little bit that I think this year has taught me that, you know, less is actually more, particularly in terms of research. And you just got to value what you can do and do that really well, as opposed to just trying to cram in everything and, and you know, and feel like you're kind of spitting yourself so uh, so kind of so thinly across the academy, actually, because I think in the past few years that culture has really kind of again sped up, hasn't it, in terms of um, what, what we're kind of all putting ourselves through in terms of of what we um what we demand there's a great new book that's just come out actually by angela matt robbie a, a prolific cultural theorist um and uh i think she's got some interesting things to say about the academy so joe i don't know if you want to have a chat at some point maybe and just think about how those ideas could might feed into the plans that you've set afoot there that's it for me brilliant and um as you said the opportunity that um virtual these types of virtual fora has provided you've already started engaging with Joe um, on other areas that you can explore fantastic um, Lala yeah, so well um, I think that this Covid situation is called it's kind of caused a, a crisis um, in you know an existential crisis in who we are uh, as people and as a nation um, emotionally, I mean, a lot of people have been denied what they usually do, go on holiday, go and drink and um, go out. And that has caused them to kind of think, who, who are they? What is the meaning of their lives? Um, what I hope from my research anyways to take forward is to look at the most valuable, important things in life. Um, the things about caring, the things about the women that we saw, they didn't have a crisis or an existential crisis. They just um, worked. And I sort of want to bring up this. It's like a conundrum, really, that um, we're thinking who, you know, we what whether we should do that and whether you have a choice to do it. Um, 
So it brings up lots of things about how to proceed after this. And hopefully there'll be change because things that, like after the First World War or the Second World War, these huge collective events do make us analyze who we are. And hopefully we can keep the good things um, like caring for each other, um, like not having old people's homes, like having the people, all the different things that are good and keep those things rather than throw them out. And so it's a, I think it's an important time of learning and definitely <laughs> looking at art, I'm going to, you know, is, is and I'm only going to promote my own field, but um, any type of art that's, because art, artists are, are constantly questioning, we're always having an ex existential crisis. Um, and researchers are, aren't we? We're all questioning. Um, and so it's very, very important time to, to think about what's important and bring that forward. Okay, thank you very much. Just one comment from me is I wonder whether, and we talked about escapism or, or looking at um, the role of women more broadly, whether we use work as a form of escapism as well from, you know, that um, emotion that we have to have and separating that work from our, our personal life from that work as well. So I see, see you nodding because I, um, I know that I've um, valued work very much and escape from that home environment to come in come into the office or into into you know into a different environment and that emotionally has a has a um, has an impact on us as well okay thank you very much um we'll go to some questions that have come from our audience so um there's a question here from deborah cartmel to vicky and it says, can you make any comparisons between film consumption in World War II and audiences' television choices during the pandemic? Yeah, Deb, it's a really interesting question. It made me think of the, the cycle of Gainsborough costume dramas that were produced in the 40s. Um, if anyone's ever seen The Wicked Lady, Margaret Lockwood is the Wicked Lady where she was a highway woman. Um, mm -hmm. Fantastic text. Um, and, and obviously, I think you can see, you know, that those those um, dramas acting as a form of escapism from the, the horrors of war that people experienced in that period. But I, su I suppose in some ways, I think actually the dramas of, of the 40s were, were perhaps gave women more, um, more scope than perhaps Bridget actually does. Um, because I think what we've got, what we're dealing with now is post-feminism, a really kind of uh, troubling concept which suggests that contemporary fictions that women now have a that women can now you know have a choice we've done we've we've had feminism the goals of liberal feminism of quality have been achieved and now women can do anything they want to be and i, I suppose the gloss and the glamour although i quite indulgently enjoyed bridgerton it really troubles me on another level to think about what these dramas are offering in terms of the choices that women have and indeed i, I would argue that what bridgerton does is offer us a, a version of a um of pre-feminism, which we looks remarkably mm. like post-feminism, where everyone's empowered and everyone has the language to talk about inequality. And Daphne is at the centre of it going to court and it's it's suggesting that, you know, she's on about the status of marriage for the modern woman. But she but across the drama, I would argue certainly that what it does, it suggests that cl that classic post-feminist uh, uh, discourse that once women have a choice, they will naturally choose home and a family. And that other choices, like Eloise's choice to not have that, is sort of more kind, seen as more quirky. Mm -hmm. And so that's really troubling to me that in this age of supposed choice and empowerment, which which is clearly not there, look at the stats that Joe's just quoted. Yeah. That is, it's the kind of remarketing and repackaging of, of that. And that's what that gets me a more, I suppose, a more enabling text for me in the current position would be um, would be called The Midwife, actually, because it does chime with those caring discourses that Lala's just talked about. Although, again, you know, it's still about women in caring roles. It's still about romanticising that and self-sacrifice being at the centre of them. Um, which, it, which to take us back to those films of the 40s, you know, women were posed there as that dual role between um, duty and desire. And after the war, they were kind of trying to be repackaged back into, back into the home, not unproblematically, not unambivalently, but that's what fictions have done. So there's a sort of continuation where women continue to be kind of re, repackaged in terms of femininity, however it's sold as pre-feminism or post-feminism. 
Thank you, Becky. So, Lala, there's a comment. Um, there's a comment from Anne Burrell, which says that these images make me realise how infrequently women are central to um, photographic imagery when leading their usual lives, um, as opposed to being scantily clad or and or glamorised. Um, some comment on that. That's brilliant. Uh, can I can I use that quote in my <laughs> next <laughs> my next write up? Yeah, that's brilliant. Fantastic. I'll be using that <laughs> because that is true. Uh, as I say, it wasn't intentional. It's just, um, you know, I just see them and then take them. So it's just been caught from my subconscious. Mm -hmm. See that. And it's and it reminds me of some of the images that I've seen on my travels as well of, of women in that caring role. Um, in Africa and in India and various other places that um, and very similar you know how that crib is used multi-purpose and um, older siblings um, are the caring uh, yeah. individuals within families etc so yeah fantastic thank you yeah. um, and a question for you Lala as well from uh, Deborah Cartmel women seem to blend um, into their surroundings in your photographs are you intentionally addressing issues of women's invisibility? Brilliant well, question. Yeah, I, um, as I said, it's not, uh, you know, it's more the, my process is to um, just not really concentrate mentally, but emotionally. So I'll walk into a space and whatever moves me, I'll capture. And I'm not thinking, is this going to promote women's lib or is it going to, it's not got a, often in art, you just do things that are, important to you and that you're inspired by so i think it's just being moved by seeing a scene and then just capturing it not even having an idea where that is going to end up is it going to be in an exhibition a book so i'm not really thinking of the outcome it's more or less your journey of life thank you um and another question for you lala as well from ann burrell um, were the women comfortable with being photographed in their daily lives? Um, and did they rush around to kind of, you know, uh, tidy up, clear around uh, the space around them before you clicked your camera? Not, no, no, because um, they weren't really, most of them weren't aware of um, what a photograph could do and where it could come out. And so there wasn't this feeling. It was a much more natural feeling. And I have a way of, not really being in your face with my camera as though this is going to be recording you forever and you'll have dirty um you know saucepan in the photo um it's much more of a natural thing so nobody they were at ease and it, they didn't feel like they're going i have a way of not trying to examine them saying look you haven't washed your um clothes or something it, it's a more of a um natural so I, I have a, people trust me and I, they know I'm going to show to the best advantage the picture. Thank you. So something for the panel from me. Um, last year's International Women's Day was um, each for equal. What progress do you think we've made since the last year, if any? <laughs> I, can, I can make a start on that if you want to. Please, Joe. Um, I, I'm not sure that we've got any measurable progress in terms of statistics. I think partly because of the disruption we faced with with lockdown and COVID and things being really quite so different. So to try and look at a particular metric or measure on, on what progress we might have made at the university, for example, on equality, I think is challenging. But we should retrospectively try and do that. Um, there are issues. Uh, one thing, and I tweeted about this this morning because my um, research interest is housing and homelessness. So one thing I'm particularly concerned about um, is that we should um, enable a society where every woman is able to feel safe and at home. And quite a lot of the issues around homelessness are not um, people in sleeping bags on a pavement in a doorway. A lot, a lot of homelessness is hidden. So this is precarious or unsafe housing. It might be an insecure place to be, so uh, where someone feels at threat of, of domestic or family violence. So I think there's a long way to go on that. And there are a few um, articles that have made the news um, and 
an uh, older man recently um, was given a sentence of five years for manslaughter um, for killing his wife. And when you read the details of it, I think there was quite some reflection in the press that this really, this really was not fair, that we need to address this issue of violence against women uh, and particularly that violence that's hidden in the home. So we've had Jess Phillips talk to us before uh, for DMU Women, and she's talked about this, but we have to stop this. We have to, to um, try and improve uh, how we as a society talk about this. We don't shy away from it, that we, we tackle this head on. So I don't think we have made progress in terms of that mm -hmm. particular issue around hidden homelessness that is linked with domestic and family violence and trauma that leads to homelessness. I think it's stagnated um, during um, COVID and in fact it's been even more hidden than it was before. So that's not um, an optimistic response to start us off on, but it's an honest mm -hmm. appraisal of where I think we're at now. No, I think I, I agree with you. And um, we're hearing more and more about the impact of COVID on mental health, um, which is, is another contributory factor to what you've just said. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, Lala? Yeah, I haven't got the statistics or I just have a feeling that it seems to have gone backwards rather than any progress. Um, so we've gone back into the home and from those figures that you showed joe you know you got the feeling it's gone backwards so um yeah it's going to be um interesting how we're going to improve from where we are we should see what we're going to say next year yes. this time. <laughs> thank you and vicky yeah, your I thoughts on this I don't think I've got much to much further to say. Really. I'd love to know that the stuff, you know, where I'd love to have some further stats. But yeah, as Lala's also said, I think Joe's um, paper there gave a really good insight into, you know, the big headlines of what's happened this year in terms of the divisions of labour generally. Um, I guess it remains to be seen what's going to happen in the next, the following year, isn't it? As we hopefully come out of COVID and what um, how equality bears on that behaviour. Okay. And um, another one from me then, if you were to make a pledge to choose a challenge, one thing this year, what would you choose to challenge this year? What would it be and why? I'm putting you on the spot, unfortunately. I'm sorry for that. For me, it is. It's the thing around home and homelessness. It's um, it's ensuring the, the right balance between um, societal support, um, intervention to support women in that um, invisible domestic work so that they can live their lives, but also um, support so that they feel safe. And this is something I say again and again, and it is it is linked to the theme of housing, but until we have enough affordable social housing, um, we're not ever going to get to that position. So we see homelessness um, perhaps as something slightly outside of the mainstream social housing sector, um, but it has to be part and parcel of it. We have to plan for this. Um, so um, I want people to feel at home, but as I talk about in my book, Place and Identity, this doesn't just mean feeling at home at home. So this is about extending it beyond the, the, those private walls of home. So we, we need to structure in that support so people feel they've got somewhere to live and feel secure. But women also need to feel at home in their work environment. So at all levels of social life for women, we need to structure in that support. So my challenge and I'm, I'm taking on um, in June, I, I become president of my professional body, the Chartered Institute of Housing. So I'm going to plug this actually because this is my <laughs> challenge. <laughs> It's around being homeful rather than homeless. And that homefulness has to be in all aspects of our lives. So that's what I'm choosing to challenge between uh, now and next year. Thank you very much, Jo. Um, Lala? Well, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, the one thing I'd choose to challenge would be the, could you say government, or is that too political for this? So I would just challenge... Can you say that? You're allowed. 
<laughs> not Why not? You've said it. You've said it. <laughs> okay. So I challenge the government definitely, and so we need to. To, to, to make that change, we need to really, uh, I think it's equality is the main thing. Financial equality um, um, is, the gaps are gonna get bigger and bigger and the homelessness will get more and more. The ghettos will get bigger and bigger. So I would challenge that in my roundabout way, you know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute with a question from um, our participants. Um, Vicky. Yeah, I think, I think, just thinking about that, Angela, about Robbie Buck as well, and about all the clapping for carers that we've seen this year. I think caring, you know, and individualism is something that is so mm. such a powerful statement of neoliberalism. And I'd love us to be move, move to something which is a bit. I mean, sorry, this sounds really touchy feely, doesn't it? But it, but it, it is around creating more of a, a caring. Um, and collaborative context within the university and beyond as well. So in my own research or in my own kind of context about caring for my colleagues, I, think, I do think it's about slowing down. I do think it's about creating, a, I think the academy has become so much about competitiveness and producing things. It would be great to slow everything down. Um, but I also keep thinking what's what sort of haunted me through in the pandemic are all those, women and, and also men, but particularly for me, women, because of my research, I suppose, who are suffering from domestic violence, or all those mm. vulnerable children. Um, and I just think, you know, all those people experiencing mental health difficulties, especially if they have children at home all of this time, you know, where's the kind of care, where's the, again, the, the, the government funding for that? So I'm not sure if I could tackle the, those bigger questions on my own, um, but certainly I think just to be, just to be a bit more kind of caring and uh, not try and, um, slot so easily into the kind of neoliberal game, I think, is my personal pledge. Thank you very much, Vicky. So the question there from Anne Burrell is, um, there's been a lot of comment about the lack of women's voices with regards to government policy and the pandemic. So I note that a key voice is reported to be that of Carrie Simmons, um, Johnson's partner. Firstly, with regard to her stated commitment to the environmental issues, and now regarding the refurbishment of 11 Downing Street. Um, can you comment on this narrative? I'll go to Lala. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't comment. <laughs> Fair um, enough. I'm just, I don't mind I'll having see. a try. Have a I, think, I think it's good to have a discussion. Sandra. <laughs> It's good to have a discussion on this, I think, because um, media representation of women's voices, um, I think it polarises. And I, I must admit, I'm looking forward to watching the interview this evening with Meghan Markle and Oprah Winfrey, because the, the trailing it's had in the media, just this juxtaposition of good mm -hmm. and bad, this binary that's put on a woman who has been through a lot, has been through a lot, a lot and some of it is frankly racist um misogynistic it's quite vile stuff in the media and i think we need to uh really reflect on what women do in the media so they they're used to the media um as uh either um heroes or, or villains heroines or villainesses however we, we want to frame this um, and I think that's why the work that Lala has done is so important because it puts women in there every day. So I think the way that Carrie is being portrayed, and I've not read it, I, I um, must admit, I, I tend not to um, read some of the papers that, that perhaps portray her in this way, but I know from conversations with my mum how this comes across in some of the, the newspaper tabloids. Um, I, I think she's portrayed in a certain way and it's almost why is she got that voice in, in this particular area and this must be problematic for partners of very senior women it'd be interesting to see how Jill Biden treads this path um, of having a voice but then not being seen as unelected and influencing so I think it's a challenge I think women perhaps get judged more harshly in the media when they're in that role um, and I, I think we need to hold the media to account in how they treat women in their in their stories 
So that's a waffly answer that I've had a go at it. <laughs> no, that's a brilliant answer. Thank you very much, Jo. Vicky, would you? Is there a comment from you? Um, I think I think what Jo's just said there, you know, sums up perfectly in terms of um, how women are, are are represented in the media. For all, and you can see that spectrum, can't you? With this is sort of repertoire there, regime of representation from dramas all the way over to news. And I think, you know, we have to think about also the underrepresentation of women in politics as well and how that's mapped onto the same structures of cultural sexism. So we're, we're back into that whole science circular, which was quite depressed on International Women's Day. But I think that's precisely the kind of issues that we need to focus on. That's not just a celebration of today. It's about what's actually what work we still have to do. Thank you. It's a perfect point to uh, conclude our uh, webinar today. I'd um, like to thank you, our speakers, for your fantastic and insightful talks. Really, really interesting. Um, also, thanks to the audience for watching and your comments and questions. Um, our next event in this series is on the 22nd of March for World Water Day. And we hope that you'll be able to join us for that event and others in the series. And um, that's all for me um, at the moment, but just to say to everyone who has joined us in this conversation and to our speakers again, thank you very much for some brilliant talks and discussion. Thank you all and happy thank International you. Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Bye.